Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> we hear a lot talking about uh, generative AI these days and uh, its application. Uh, before uh, this term became so popular, uh, some of our colleagues uh, started leveraging the uh, properties of the generative models in a niche uh, uh, of uh, R&D, which is uh, to produce uh, food and drinks, so aliments. And uh, this is uh, what we will be talking about, uh, Ailey and myself, uh, during this session. Before starting, let's make a, take a step back and uh, um, talk about uh, uh, an overview of generative models, uh, thinking about uh, the historical perspective, uh, the technical perspective, and uh, uh, more broadly in uh, uh, where they are applied. From historical perspective, uh, generative models uh, are not a new concept. <clears throat> the uh, oldest uh, mention of uh, generative models uh, that we could find uh, is dated to 1894 when uh, uh, the mathematician Carl Persson used uh, some Gaussian mixtures to uh, solve a problem of uh, estimating uh, a certain proportion in the body of uh, a thousand of crabs uh, which were sampled from uh, the Bay of Naples. According to uh, some evolutionary theories, uh, some zoologists suggested that uh, uh, the asymmetric distribution that he was observing would be uh, ascribed to a divergence in evolution, so presence of more uh, uh, species. Effectively, when he tried to uh, solve this problem, by the way, analytically, uh, he solved the nine degree polynomial by hand, no laptop at the time. So already this was an achievement. Uh, he found that uh, the, the best solution uh, consisted in two different uh, uh, Gaussians, so two different uh, species of crabs. <clears throat> this is uh, the oldest uh, that uh, you can find in history. Then uh, 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 more uh, recent, uh, there are also Markov models, uh, which are a type of generative models uh, really popular uh, for uh, among biologists to study sequences. And these were already used uh, in the 70s of the previous century. So it's not a new thing. Uh, this is a, a very important trait of uh, uh, the uh, nature of the generative models. So they are being uh, uh, probabilistic because there are stochastic elements. And uh, there is this... Uh, a diagram to show you uh, the mechanism in, in a simplified way uh, how a generative model works. Imagine you have a, a two-dimensional distribution of training data. You train your generative model. So we think about Carl Pearson. We uh, use a, a mission of uh, Gaussian distributions. And what we get is a, a distribution of the joint or full probability, P, D, X1 and X2. We use this distribution, which approximates the unknown uh, real data generation mechanism. This will resonate with all of you which are uh, passionate about Bayesian statistics. And you can use this uh, distribution to uh, generate new data through a sampling mechanism. And those of you who uh, used, for example, uh, uh, LLM via an API, uh, when you uh, choose uh, the temperature, you are acting on the, this sampling mechanism. So you obtain uh, a point out of this. Sometimes to uh, better appreciate uh, how a concept works, it's useful to compare to something which is uh, known uh, before or it's simpler. In this case, we choose a discriminative model. So you start with... Uh, some training data, X with a label Y. You train a discriminative model. Imagine you have a, a regression or a, a classification type of problem. And the output is uh, either a value or a class uh, that is uh, determined uh, based on uh, the conditional distribution. So you get a prediction. From this comparison, you can notice that uh, the output is different. In, for generative models, you get a, a point instance, while for the discriminative models, you get uh, either a value or a class. And uh, indeed, it's uh, more complex. This uh, 
additional complexity or challenge has been uh, explained well with a metaphor from uh, Ian Goodfellow on Quora some years ago where uh, he said uh, uh, that if you look at the painting and uh, recognize it as uh, being Mona Lisa, uh, you probably can do this. And this is uh, being able to apply a discriminative model task. While uh, can you paint the Mona Lisa yourself? Probably not. Uh, this is generative modeling, which implies that in one case, uh, what you want to do is able to distinguish between points, while in the other case, uh, you need to be able to uh, understand more of the features. For example, uh, what type of uh, painting style had Leonardo, the physiognomy traits of a woman who lived in 1500 in uh, Lombardia, uh, the type of landscape at the time. So much richer type of knowledge is required. But why are these uh, models so important and useful? Uh, the reason is that we can use them uh, to uh, generate new data. And there are uh, uh, several um, type of, uh, type, types of applications where they shine. Uh, the, the most uh, popular is, of course, generate new text or images or a combination of the two. For example, images from text using uh, uh, GPT models or using diffusion models or using GANs. But also in scientific simulation, in, in the scientific uh, uh, environment, uh, the uh, generative models uh, are very popular. For example, they are used to test uh, cosmological theories, or they are used uh, in uh, uh, high energy physics or condensed matter physics to simulate the um, uh, particle showers. So how the beam uh, of a particle uh, would percolate through uh, materials. And uh, in this picture, for example, you can see a comparison which was made by a group working at the CERN in, at the Large Hadron Collider between uh, uh, Giant, uh, which is a software using uh, Monte Carlo simulation and uh, um, generative adversarial networks. And they claim uh, uh, generative adversarial networks, that despite being a bit less accurate, were uh, um, providing a, a gain in terms of speed of uh, five orders of magnitude. Last but not least, and this is uh, uh, really relevant for our talk, is that we can use generative models to create new products, for example, food or drinks. And now we're going to delve deeper into the task of the recipe generation. We're going to try to be product developers for, for a bit. Um, so in these uh, companies, these clients that we work with, um, they have people called product developers that are responsible for creating new products. So mainly they have three main tasks. I, either they can like try to come up with something completely new, um, or they could try to make existing products uh, better or uh, change some ingredients in, in existing products. Imagine that you have a situation that uh, one of your ingredients is um, over a limit on, on some regulatory um, nutritional values. So you want to replace that ingredient with, with another. Um, so these are the types of problems that they're, they're solving. Um, and an example of, of how a product developer works is they, they get an idea from somewhere. It could be marketing, could be their own head, and they talk with the business to decide if this is a good idea to move forward. Um, they start ideating with, with some uh, product ideas, coming up with ingredients to use, coming up with things that they want to measure for those, for those products to see if their uh, project is successful and, and things like that. So after they've had this product concept creation, they go, go to this iterative process of creating prototypes, uh, evaluating them with an, usually an internal testing panel, and uh, then going back to the drawing board um, to do a couple more uh, prototypes to do iteration on. And 
often they also do this iteration in the in the lab as well. So the product developer creates the product, tastes it themselves, um, and then uh, do this kind of pre-filtering. Um, and often there's also a third party involved um, called Flavor House. So imagine that you want you want to use a strawberry f flavor. You're gonna ask a flavor house to pr uh, produce produce that. So that ad adds a little bit of complexity and a little bit of unknowns uh, to the system. And finally, after some internal testing, um, there is a consumer panel where they make sure that these um, products are are liked also by the consumers, not just their internal people. Um, and of course, the iteration can go, can then go back to the back to the product developer. Um, but hopefully, if all goes well in this process, finally you have a product. Um, in this case, a drink. Um, and one example is the is the mango mocktail that you probably already try, tried. Um, this is a demo that we did so it's not like fully um scientific enough for for the uh food companies but uh, a good illustrative um example so we've chosen four ingredients mango syrup sparkling water apple juice and lime juice we set some uh limits for those with limits that we thought were good we probably want some more apple juice and um, and uh, sparkling water than lime juice and mango syrup. The mango syrup is quite um, sweet, so we don't want it to be too sweet. So the limits are, are slightly lower there. Um, you can also set constraints. I don't think that our demo actually has this constraint, but just as an example, you could have a constraint that in total you want less than five grams of um, sugar in the recipe. And you can imagine if you're if you're a food company, you might want to, um, or you might have to comply with some legal constraints that your product can't have this many additives or something like that. Um, and then finally, what we also need to set is the attributes that we're going to evaluate. So, what are the things that, when tasting, are we uh, actually evaluating? And in this case. And often, uh, where our main objective is to optimize overall liking, so make make the best tasting uh, product. Um, and uh, to support that, we have um, some other attributes that um, should have correlation uh, or might have correlation with the overall liking that support the. Uh, prediction of the of the overall liking and give us a little bit more information about um, about how how the recipe actually tastes like now let's try to generate new recipes with the uh, larger language models we we try to um, ask this uh, uh, example uh, question of the mocktail to ChatGPT, uh, just to have a, a qualitative indication of what the, the response would be. It's not uh, comparative because we didn't uh, run any project with LLMs, but still we thought it could be uh, interesting in these days to uh, have also this just this qualitative test. So in our first prompt, uh, we are um, asking the system to uh, generate a new recipe with the same ingredients with at an R&D level and uh, uh, optimized for overall liking. And the first completion that we get is the following. Uh, here is just an extract. Uh, there is a description at the, be at, the, at the beginning, which was cut off for uh, uh, image purposes. Then uh, we are suggested a, a mango sparkler mocktail, uh, which we looked uh, up in, in the World Wide Web, and uh, you can see it's uh, it has a uh, some good score on on some website for drinks. So it makes sense this type of answer. 
there are the ingredients and after the ingredients there is also a description of how you should uh, prepare it like like a cookbook exactly we ask uh, uh, a second prompt to stay within the constraint if you remember the example uh, there is a min and max for each ingredients of the mango cock mango mocktail and this is the result so um we can notice that uh, it's very easy to get uh, uh, something out and also that makes sense uh, you can uh, trace back the recipe at least in this case uh, where there are very common ingredients uh, we can say the ingredients are within the range but there are some um, defects or hallucination because we didn't ask for ice we didn't ask for a uh, uh, um, mint to garnish so it's something to to pay attention to and um, it's optimizing for the overall liking because there is a match compared to uh, the score that uh, some people gave in the training data but it's it looks like uh, this type of solution would not be robust enough uh, to run further uh, optimization uh, because say we continue with the next prompt saying okay we tested this recipe and it tastes too sour there is no guarantee of uh, how would be the next iteration because it's not uh, relying on uh, uh, optimization based on uh, strong guarantees so it's something that seems to be appropriate for a uh, kitchen use restaurant use but uh, not robust enough for uh, uh, R&D application level and now for a different approach um, that's um, maybe based on a slightly um, more traditional uh, generative approaches than LLMs um, so here uh, we start with the with the product developer uh, who sets sets up the project, sets up the constraints and everything like we went through with the Mango ex, uh, example. And the product developer interacts with the generative um, model. And inside the generation process, we have a tandem of, of two uh, models. We have a predictor model and a generator model. The generator model tries to generate um, new recipes um, that optimize for the overall liking. And the predictor model uh, provides feedback to the generator model um, and tries to predict as best it can the overall liking for, for the recipe. So in tandem, these two uh, uh, models um, try to give you the best and do the optimization and give you the best overall liking. Um, but then we go to the actual people because the mo predictor model needs some data to, uh, to learn and the generator needs some data to learn. So with this iterative process, um, we have the consumer panel that after each, each round of generation, they taste and score and then that uh, data is fed back to the back to the um, model to learn uh, for the for the next round and this is an example of uh, how such a system uh, would be designed in a, in a client setting so the uh, ml uh, part uh, we use a, a python open source library we containerize it and uh, uh, deploy in whatever fits the the request of the problem or the infrastructure of the client. We have a centralized database that collects all the data according to a schema, schema which is also important because uh, there are some strong guarantees that we want on the data. The product developers uh, interacts through a UI interface, controlling uh, the constraints. Um, the 
score the recipes. And uh, the same UI is also used to uh, take a look at the recipes, like you, you saw uh, in the demo. Prepare the new batch of uh, drinks or, or food. Uh, consumer panel, uh, depending on the client, uh, there might be a proprietary system or not, but it's something that resembles, say, a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet uh, represents the payload, which is sent to a message system. So it's an event-driven architecture. And then as soon as all the data, all the scores from um, the last iteration are collected, the, the uh, ML service uh, can start to generate a new batch of recipe and so on. And now um, I'm going to explain uh, what kind of challenges there are in the in the real world uh, and how this system is helping helping uh, these companies solve those uh, challenges. So, first of all, there's multiple challenges with how the experimentation, how the iteration is is going on. Um, so, first of all, the the search space is complicated. You have multiple different ingredients. You're trying to optimize for uh, multiple different things at the same time. Um, and you have to also take into account the constraints. Um, then secondly, doing doing this objectively might be a dif bit difficult if the product developer is doing samples on, on their own. Uh, doing this pre-filtering, you have no guarantees of, of objectivity there. Um, and all of this uh, leads to a low success rate overall in, in these uh, projects traditionally. But then um, with this system, the algorithm already takes care of all the limits, all the uh, constraints. So it fr frees up the... Um, Frees, frees up some space for the product developer th to focus on on more important things. Um, this system is able to uh, optimize, um, so it's it's searching and optimizing at the same time. And we can have multiple objectives, for example, uh, doing overall liking versus cost um, can be done simultan simultaneously. And then all of this then leads to a better success rate. And uh, with a better success rate and faster iteration, you can do more projects or better pro projects, depending on, on what you want. Another types of challenges or category of challenges is the one that relates to the data ecosystem. Because uh, you can imagine R&D is at the forefront of uh, new ideas or new problems so uh, you might start a project where you don't have uh, historical data so it's a, a frequent uh, condition that you, you work in no or low data regime another problem is that uh, there might be different laboratories or different groups so the data is scattered among all these units uh, or also with third parties and it's not um, uh, collected in, in a centralized place. And there might be different groups working on similar pro problems and developing a uh, distinct solution. So there are a lot of point solution. Uh, some of the benefits of the uh, AI augmented approach with respect to those pain points are that uh, we can leverage uh, active learning, which is a, you can think of, of it as a, a uh, efficient form of sampling to uh, cope with uh, the absence or uh, uh, being in a low data regime. We can decide uh, at different stages of the project if we need to work more on the exploration or more on the exploitation. Uh, the presence of a centralized uh, data store uh, favors the collection of uh, all the data in the same place. and. Uh, uh, we also make sure that uh, there is a schema so that uh, the data is uh, uh, well structured. Um, if uh, the, the product being developed, developed has a certain coherence uh, between them, this solution also represents a, um, 
uh, something that can be reused and scaled. So you avoid all this uh, uh, proliferation of uh, distinct solution. Uh, then on the human side of things, um, there are also uh, some challenges. So one of the challenges that these companies uh, face is that uh, experience plays a big role. So uh, uh, a senior product developer is able to do a project much faster than a junior uh, product developer. Um, so that's a that's a big challenge for them because retention is, is important um, and... Uh, uh, onboarding new people is difficult. Um, also, we're trying to um, implement this AI augmented uh, system. There might be skepticism to, uh, towards AI um, within the within the product developers, um, and they have some established ways of working uh, that we have to kind of uh, complement. Uh, to get our our system um, adopted. So, on this sense, um, I always try to advocate for augmentation uh, rather than automation. Uh, this system could work completely automatically. Just rate some um, rate some products, and and that's it. But with with human guidance, it's it's the Final result is usually better. Um, so, with the with the data collection and everything, uh, um, we foster collective knowledge sharing because um, all the product developers have access to the same knowledge base that is now collected uh, within the system, um, and also we can um, use learnings from past projects. We can reuse some of the data um, for a similar project later on uh, to increase the success rate um, of a project. Um, to address the adoption and skepticism part, we put the product developer as, um, as the driver in this system. So they know what's going on. Um, they they can veto some some recipes if they seem very bad and um, tweak the constraints if if things are going wrong. Over the years, uh, we worked with uh, uh, several companies uh, on different types of projects in the uh, CPG domain to develop new snacks, uh, new whiskies, uh, prototype new beverages. And uh, as you can see from this uh, feedback, uh, the, it has been a, a positive experience uh, overall because the method has proven to be effective. Uh, it has shown to be repeatable, so it was not something that happened just uh, with one client. And there are tangible benefits, um, something we didn't talk about uh, on, on the slide is that, for example, the fact that there is a sufficient sampling allow, allows to save a lot of money in terms of uh, not only time of people, but also uh, raw materials, which are not wasted because you get quicker to faster to uh, a viable solution. So it is uh, uh, promising uh, uh, and successful uh, approach. So. There is one missing slide, but I will I will tell it by word. Uh, so far, we discussed uh, about uh, uh, recipe generation, and uh, uh, which is tested by a panel of humans uh, to assess sensory attributes to improve the recipe. But let's try to uh, make an abstraction. So uh, let's uh, generalize from recipe to a more generic term, which is formulation, and uh, instead of uh, sensory attributes, let's think about functional properties. These might be mechanical properties or chemical properties or physical properties. So it becomes evident that this approach uh, is a good candidate also to solve the problems in other types of R&D labs, as uh, perfumes, uh, development of chemicals, 
uh, development of uh, cosmetics or research of new materials. And we think that uh, uh, this uh, AI augmented approach uh, can be the um, can boost the creativity uh, for a lot of other uh, future uh, R and D labs. Thanks. Okay.